Hello and welcome everybody to our De Gruyter Book Talk series today with Professor Nali, who um, works at the moment as a fellow at the University of Vienna, the Public History Department. Um, we are here today to talk about her brand new book, Seeing History, Public History in China, which published just, I think, eight to ten weeks ago uh, in December of last year. Prior to that book, however, um, she has already published two other books, one um, with Toronto University Press, uh, Kensington Market, Collective Memory, Public History and Toronto's Urban Landscape, and one with Peking University Press in 2019 called Public History, A Critical Introduction. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Robin. Um, Honor to have you. So um, maybe start off by quickly telling everybody what the book is about, just in a couple of sentences, um, and then we get into everything else. Uh, so this book essentially um, takes you on a journey about public history in China. It actually deals with the aspects of uh, different aspects of emerging field we call public history in China in the last 20 some years. Um, so um, it's essentially um, gives you an overview of, you know, how history making is kind of changed and how the authority is kind of challenged within and outside of academy. And so it dives into to the different uh, genres, uh, like say oral history, genealogy, family history, teaching history, pedagogy, and museum and historic site interpretation. And so essentially those are the projects and, and uh, reflections that I got by working with a huge number of public historians, public history educators, most important, the public on the ground across China, you know, but I'm, I'm honored to really write their stories and, you know, just reflect upon it and uh, to share that with the public. Fantastic. Yeah, it, it's um, everything about this book is fascinating and that we could fill hours talking about it. But um, the first thing that um, I would love to, to, to hear more about is what made you get into the field of public history? Um, in general, what made you become a public historian? And then also what made you interested and especially curious about um, public history in China? Uh, OK, so I always take a story back to 10 years ago. Uh, I met uh, this anonymous at the time, but um, pretty well known in China, but I didn't know this person. We call him Mr. Wu Wenguang, uh, who is an independent uh, film uh, documentary filmmaker. And he started this grassroots vernacular memory projects and a grassroots studio um, back in 2011. So what essentially this project is about integrating visual sounds into memories to document a very sensitive part of a Chinese history called Great Famine. So there are about 20 participants. We have villagers, um, documentary filmmakers, and volunteers, basically, were actively involved in. So this journey of recording and documenting individual stories and memories through visuals gradually become their quest to really understand a different part of public uh, of um, uh, different part of a Chinese history, which is still very uh, sensitive uh, and difficult. And so later that year, I carry on uh, to Suzhou, which I was sitting at the uh, um, first public history conference in Suzhou Museum. At that time, I was sitting there listening to different sessions, and I saw the public and the most local residents, they just walk in and, and, and present their stories, mostly family stories, histories, genealogies, and, and oral histories, and they try to discuss what essentially matters to them. So at that time, I was sitting there, started to think about how come such an exciting and ambulant forms of social uh, forms of knowledge uh, become an intellectual blank spot, you know, nobody was talking about it, but it's so steep in the popular memory in such a big country. And I feel those stories need telling. So that's why I wrote a book uh, essentially about public history um, in China, because these stories need telling. Very much agreed. Yeah. Um, what are there specific challenges given it's, it's well, China, not renowned for being very open about a lot of things, but does 
Well, well, maybe it's a misconception though. Does public history in China differ from public history in the Western countries, in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, wherever? Um, or um, is it not that much of a difference anyway? Uh, it, it's it's very different. I was so unprepared for the challenges when I went back to China about 10 years ago. Uh, I was trained uh, in University of Massachusetts Amherst. And uh, so what I learned in the United States and I I translate easily into Canada where I uh, did my first book about Kensington Market, you know, as a young, um, ambitious urban planning scholar. So I went into Kensington Market and I thought, you know, I was a map. I thought I am going to document this wonderful neighborhood and talk talk about, you know, their stories and all of that. Then the residents came to me and saying, you know, there are stories here. Um, you know, um, if you want to tell the stories that, you know, this is something you go beyond the architecture, beyond the zoning map, be, beyond Beyond the physical structures, which I did. Uh, so, and that, um, I noticed that with that project, it's kind of like a little bit smooth transition for what I learned, all those key ideas in public history, like a shared authority and interpret uh, an interpretive approach and working with the public and because the public are very welcoming and you know there's no censorship and you know so I got a lot of help from the local residencies and so I learned that you know and the historic built landscape should be preserved as a kind of public history. That's essentially what the argument is all about in that book. And, you know, I proposed a culturally sensitive narrative approach. So you don't go there as a physical um, planner and with a interpretive authority. You work with the residents to tell a story to preserve an environment that truly matters to them. So uh, I don't know, uh, you know, like about the impact of that book, but I know some small, similar kind of open air market is sort of adopt that kind of approach, you know, in some other parts of Canada around the world. However, when I got a call from, you know, like uh, one of the professors like in China saying, you know, hey, um, you know, we'd like to develop public history in China. And I thought, you know, this this is a great opportunity for me to really, you know, establish something there. However, uh, when I um, when I went there, I know there's a public space is not really that free. So when we we're dealing with the um, um, a climate that is not easy to talk about shared authority because the authority is not supposed to be shared, and so that is the biggest challenge. That you know, on the other hand, I I did see like about ten years ago. There's a like still you have that space. It's just not as as liberal as what you mentioned in the West, and you still have that space. And because the public, the, and we have a yearning like a public who are looking out for um, a space to document their histories while you know the historians are not really up to that at the point so we're thinking about you know we we go work with the public in that limited space we work with the system to really understand how public history works and try to establish that and so we we do have challenges but we do you know make some progress in the last 10 years or so so that's um, that's probably about the status quo. And um, just to add on that, I feel public history is very different across cultures. And, you know, so things uh, we learned um, in certain cultural contexts, you just can't really easily translate that. So, get, so you always need that kind of humility to really go into community to work with the public or take on the projects. So that's what I learned, you know, through working in different cultures in the public Absolutely, history projects. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just between the United States and Europe, um, and then within Europe, it's just different in every country, and then in the country in every region too. So I I can imagine what it must be like. But was there any kind of because you mentioned how the public was so open and how they wanted documentation of their own history? Was there before it became an academic field in China, public history? Was there a sense of well, let's let's collect um, memories in whatever form, maybe orally, maybe in in, in songs or whatever? Um, yeah, was there a sense of of doing public history or an open public history discourse, if you want, apart from the academic field? Um. Okay, so the history is always thriving outside the aca uh, academy and across cultures. And like in China, we have a, such a, a long history. And of course, you know, history uh, exists in one form of the other. And I never thought and I never think that 
history, like textbook history is the only way or, you know, monograph is the only way that you can transmit or communicate that kind of knowledge about history. So what we see in the last 20 years is different is that, you know, so with the um, convergence of media technologies, uh, we see how the public started to um, adjust up, started to get adjust up about different forms of the, uh, you know, knowledge. And the censorship can only go that far. And, you know, so and deep down, the public have the kind of venues to really, you know, document um, and to really share out that kind of knowledge. And so they create this grassroots communities, which totally bypass uh, the central authority and also the academia. And so that's what I see in the last 20 some years that history as a public history, not only as a sub-discipline within history, it's more than an expression. It's a social movement, you know, it's grassroots, it's, uh, it's, it's you know, so with the, um, uh, with the uh, development and uh, breakthrough of the digital uh, technologies and the things that people have the ways to really do that. I like that. I like that a lot because it sounds like public history is a necessity, basically. Um, and it's not something that academics come and um, push on people but that it comes from below, as you say, as a grassroots movement, which probably then makes it less of an ivory tower problem than it is right. in, in other countries, right? Where as a historian, also as a public historian, but for, for academics in general, you often have to find ways to justify what you're doing to the public because you're paid by them, right? Because right. taxes pay, right. yeah. but that, that seems to be different then. Uh, it's very different, but uh, getting back to your comment, I, I think you, you're you're right on to something that I feel public history is really like a a necessity. It's from within. It's not imposed from outside. So that's something that's not a luxury. So I think the justification, it's not just, it's not, it's more than um you need to justify what you're doing with the public because the need is there. You're just like feel emotional void just to some extent. What I find more challenging quite paradoxically is you have to justify to your fellow colleagues about you know public history, what you're doing. So that's uh, the first few years when I was back in China or back and forth trying to define public history in Chinese language, just because my colleagues and professional historians, they feel, what is that? Uh, is that like um, we don't use people's history? We don't use civic history because those are politically loaded terms. And public, it seems kind of like a lower case thing. We try, um, you know, so everybody can do it. And so you don't need specific training. You don't have any kind of, you know, responsibility or, you know, just concerns like that. So you need to justify this is an established field. You need the intellectual rigor and but also need to work with the community and that kind of communicative skills. And also you need some, you know, other skills put together a public history project. So that is probably more challenging than just fine to the public. And so I find a lot of times when I work with the team, and so working with the public actually is a little bit easier. I'm not saying it's all that easy, but you know, they, uh, as long as you explain it clearly and they will come up, you know, with the right amount of resources that, you know, but with the professional colleagues, they're trained in a different system. And then just to let you know that, you know, even museums, libraries, and, and they're trained in the different systems in China. So that means it's hard to bring in a complex pro museum project, for example, with the museum professionals, public historians, and educators, and also the general public, and uh, just because they, they speak a very different language and think, yes, justification is always needed even today. And, but I think the challenge comes from within academy, more from within the academy than outside uh, the public. That is um, an, an extremely interesting balancing act, right? With the, with the mm. general public, um, the threshold is lower because it's it's so open and, and welcoming and also not threatening in the in the right. terms of right. well you can't understand that you can't possibly understand that because you're not trained in it but on the other hand fellow academics who are like well are you actually doing real academic work here right. exactly. um without understanding that 
public history is is a field so broad and big that it infiltrates everything yes, right i mean great. video games is public history yeah. who hasn't played one um yeah. movies and all of that and you you speak about that in the book um yeah. i think it's a whole chapter even or almost yes. Uh, so yes, yes. so yes. yeah so so you i i go out on a limb here saying uh, you probably think public history is, is quite important to pursue and to keep going and to maybe push up even more in, in places like China, but everywhere oh, around the yeah. world. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I, I have a face in, in my field, uh, you know, so I, I always feel like, you know, um, especially in the last two decades, just, I'm just convinced that, you know, like public history is the future of the past and just with the uh, the technology. Some of the forward looking public hist historians were saying, um, yes, it's a nice thing. Uh, it's more than public participation. We have this massive, you know, a, a scale, you know, like a participation in history making, but I think it's more than that. I think it's the production and consumption of history. The whole pattern, the whole process has been changed, that it's merged and it's intergenerative, it's complex. So that's why I feel unless you tease out the complexity of a public history and you it, it, it's going to grow outside of just the subdiscipline in the history, uh, just like uh, when public history started in the United States back in the 1970s out of the job crisis. And so even today in the United States, we have public history. Usually it's uh, situated within the discipline of history. But I see in Asia and like in China, and I feel it's going to go, grow out of that just because the digital uh, technology has brought so much complexities that you know it just goes beyond just one single discipline we call history but you know that's where people access their data their resources people document and then people share out and people archive or curate their data uh, through the uh, uh, the digital um, uh, humanities and so that means you have to really pull out uh, a lot of forces together so it's what i call in the book it's presumption it's it's just production and consumption it's it, it, it's emergent and it's complex. And so that's, you, you have to see this is a system view of history. It's just more than just one single element is changed through public history. So we're doing more than just public participation. And another thing is more than just historians transmitting um, knowledge, historic knowledge to you know the general public because they are actually creating something groundbreaking and we have to acknowledge that. Yeah, exactly. Like, take them seriously, right? Not right. be yeah, like, exactly. oh, okay, we are the academics here. We tell you exactly what this means. Right. But the line between what, what you said, producers and consumers, right? Right, That exactly. is, like, almost disappearing. They are right. on, definitely on the same level and equally important. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there any advice you want to give to early career scholars, or maybe even grad students who think about pursuing a, um, a, a PhD in, in public history as a field um, in China, but also in general. Anything uh, you want to tell them? Yeah, I, I love talking about this and I always preach what I practice and, you know, so um, I would encourage people who are interested in history to join public history. And so there are a list of things that I feel it's more than a um, um, advice, but um, but like a reflection of the years um, that I've been working and teaching in public history. The first thing, you know, it, it is, um, um, you need to build all your public history projects on solid research. You need to know how to do research and how to, especially in the digital era, you have to really differentiate, have, have that historian's eye to really differentiate fake information from, you know, the real one. And, you know, it's getting back to the true purpose of a history. Public history is a history first, right? You need to just stick to what is essential elements in history and learn to be a good historian first and then go into the public historian. So that's one thing I can't really uh, like downplay the research skills and or rather it's a research habits, you know, how to, uh, you know, read the right questions and how to find the right information and how to uh, analyze that that, you know, so I interpret that kind of thing, uh, materials, and then try to um, create something um, that is, you know, serves the purpose of the public history project. So, so essentially, that's it's, um, about the research skills that you bring into the public history. There are two things I think it's more like in the last few years, I feel it's uh, critical. And the first is about, you know, so um, 
about how the how to handle the digital technologies. And I know we're historians, we're not, you know, like computer scientists. I understand that part. But understanding the physical structure, like the digital physical structures will help us a lot. Just take oral history as an example. Back to the old days, you know, we go out and, you know, do the tape recordings and we transcribe everything. Now it's a big data uh, era and you're, you're, we're dealing with a massive, massive audiovisual files cross-sharing. So how to digest that, index that, catalog that, and curate those kind of data. So we need, a, we need some kind of basic knowledge about the digital humanities to really go through, uh, you know, the oral history projects. And so that's the challenges, you know, I'm probably a younger, you know, historian, public historians and younger generations will face. And the last part, I, I also learned this, you know, through practicing and working with a, a lot of public historians around the world on the ground is that um, just because we're in the age of convergence of the media technologies and also the explosion of the, you know, information that I feel for any complex public history projects, usually it's a group work. You have to really work with people from different disciplines. So that capability of communicating with people from different disciplines and especially from not neighboring discipline but you know from like a physics and you know computer scientists and stuff like that and you it's it's critical to take on the complex public his, uh, history projects over a substantial period of time and work at a global scale just because the, you know digital media defines national boundaries right a lot of projects happen you know across the world so you really need that kind of savvy or skill set to really work with with people across the world. I, I know it sounds really like ideal and it sounds really like a high scale thing, but you know, it comes down to um, like the very basic, you know, how to speak the right language and how to really pull the projects together. So that kind of capability usually is trained through um, what we call field projects. So I usually build into my public history seminar. So that's a semester long projects. Uh, students take on um, like, public history projects with a real client, you know, so uh, in that um, experience, they learn how to work with people they don't like and how to speak the kind of language that, you know, maybe uh, they don't usually speak and, you know, how to deal with frustrations and how um, to work with the public, essentially. So I think those kind of things are critical for the younger generation um, of public historians to, to really, you know, at least to be aware of, you know, try to put them into practice and, you know, and, and so I think that's critical. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Couldn't agree more. And I think yeah. also that what you mentioned and the, the focus on digital tools, learning to use those tools is even more critical in an age where it feels or in the time where it feels like democratic processes all over the world are under attack so much. Right, right. So this this tool, digital public history, basically, um, being such a, a well border crossing, international, right, exactly. global way of connecting and of, 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 um, well, yeah, keeping democracy in a way alive because right, exactly. it's a very democratic, democratic process. Public history is, I think, an important task too, without politicizing it too much, and That's no cool. pressure, but yeah, it's. <laughs> Yeah. It's important. Hey, right. okay. Well, um, I want to show everybody this book again. <laughs> um, thank you so much for agreeing to come to the book talk today and talking about everything. Um, very, very honored to have your book uh, at Tick Reuter and also in the book series, um, Public History and International Perspective. Um, and I very much hope we'll work together again. Thank you, Ravio. It's, it's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>